Welcome back, one and all. This is Stephanie from Apex Languages and Gapanova School with this year's final installment of Weekly Wordplay. These past few months, I hope you've come to appreciate just a little bit more some of the historical impetuses that have helped transform English into the complicated, maddening, yet culturally rich language that it is today. Word by word, it was gradually shaped by billions of speakers from all different eras and backgrounds, and that process of never-ending change still continues. The English of yesterday was not the same as the English of today, which is distinct, too, from what the English of tomorrow will be, and that is just as much because of people like me as it is because of people like you. Yes, whether you've been speaking this language your entire life or just for a couple of years, the mistakes of today will eventually become the grammatical rules of our children's children. Some individuals have more influence than others. The most famous example, of course, is Shakespeare, credited with having single-handedly invented over 1,700 words. Today, though, in this special episode, I'm going to introduce you to a much less well-known innovator who deserves more appreciation, the father of American English, my great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, Noah Webster. Noah Webster was born October 16th, 1758 in Connecticut. His family name actually used to be an English term for female weavers, and sure enough, he came from a long line of humble cloth makers. Attempting to escape that life, Noah settled for the life of a teacher, not the lucrative, glamorous profession that it is today, mind you. Schools back then were miserable, with as many as 70 children, aged 6 to 16, all crammed together in one room with nothing more than benches, no desks, no heat, poorly trained, poorly paid instructors, and only a few old, outdated British books, the same ones for all levels. Realizing that this system was clearly insufficient, and as a patriotic American, upset that his textbook still had children pledging allegiance to the hated King George, in 1783, Webster sat down to write a book. A Grammatical Institute of the English Language, or the Blueback Speller, as it became more commonly known, revolutionized education throughout the country. It was the number one school book used in the United States for a hundred years, selling more than 50 million copies and introducing the idea that America deserved its own American English. Pretty soon, Webster was hobnobbing with the likes of Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, and George Washington, who even offered him a job tutoring his own children. Webster wasn't done yet, though. In 1801, he began work on his magnus opus, the American Dictionary of the English Language. It took him 27 years to complete, required him to learn 26 languages for research purposes, and in the end contained almost 70,000 words, tens of thousands of which, despite everyday usage among colonists, had never been officially recognized before that. We're not just talking about exotic Native American words like skunk and hickory, although he added those too, but common everyday words, including advocate, Census, nutrient, psychology, electrician, debt, immigrant, slang, and 2021's word of the year, vaccine. It was also the first major dictionary to list the letters I and J and U and V separately. Noah Webster died in 1843, and that very same year the rights of his great work were bought up by two brothers running a printing company, George and Charles Merriam. Merriam-Webster dictionaries continue to be one of the most trusted names in the business today. Amazon.com's number three top seller among all dictionaries and thesauri. 
The Oxford English Dictionary came in number 12. Webster's greatest contribution of all, however, had to do not with the book itself, but the spelling reforms it inspired throughout the entire country. You don't need to be an expert to recognize that English spelling can get a little ridiculous at times. Webster was both an expert and a pragmatist. Not only did traditional British standards make writing more challenging for children and adults alike, but based on his extensive etymological research, simplified spelling was also more in line with English's original Anglo-Saxon and Latin roots. In other words, despite all their claims about upholding tradition, the Brits were just complicating things for complication's sake. Or, even worse, they were taking France's side in a matter of English national pride, seeing as it was the French speakers that had mangled everything in the first place. Americans deserved better. It should first be noted that many of Webster's attempted spelling reforms, logical and well-intentioned as they may have been, simply didn't catch on. Here are a few early duds. Pause now if you want to guess what they were trying to replace. There you go. One can dream, right? I mean, any opportunity to get rid of a U-G-H-T word like daughter is a good one to take, right? Alas, though, it was not meant to be. However, here is another list of spelling changes that did stick and which still play an important role in distinguishing British from American English today. First, Webster eliminated the silent U from words like color and honor. He also replaced the final C's in defense and license with S's. The RE at the end of center and leader was flipped to become ER. It'd be so much better if uh, they could do the same thing with the LE endings, right? He eliminated the extra L in past tense and present participle forms of verbs like travel and cancel. And he did manage to speak by a few other assorted simplifications, including words like plow, draft, and jail, for which I'm certainly grateful. One change he suggested that even the British learned to love was getting rid of the K at the end of words like public and music. You're welcome. That being said, Noah Webster can't take the credit for all of American English's peculiarities, if you're British, that is, improvements if you're not. For example, what about alternative past tense forms like learned, learnt, and dreamed, dreamt? Irregular verb forms, although the hated bane of anyone who's ever tried to study English, are a fascinating window into language change in action. A number of verbs such as fit, fitted, lit, lighted, and dove, dived, really do have more than one acceptable form because they're actively undergoing the process of standardization. Within a few generations, they should be completely regular. There is another collection of verbs, usually ending with the letter T, which is already completely standardized in the United States, but which is still being held hostage in conservative old England. Last but not least, another big difference all learners should be aware of is that between super useful ISE and IZE verb suffixes, meaning to make or do something, as in those found at the end of criticize and nationalize. It's a bit of an oversimplification to say that the English always use an S and the Americans always go for Z, but that is generally how things tend to pan out nowadays. Both variations have actually existed side by side for centuries, ISE from French and ICE from Greek versions of the same ancient root. Even more surprising, the Oxford English Dictionary and Encyclopedia Britannica both officially support IZE spelling. Nonetheless, the dirty little secret of linguistics is that people determine the fate of language not scholars, educators, or even lexicographers, dictionary writers. 
So expect to see those endings around still for a long time yet. So to summarize, during his lifetime, Noah Webster rose from total obscurity to single-handedly spark much needed reform in the national school system, inspire fellow patriotic Americans to recognize and take control of their own language, compile the largest dictionary of his day, and enact sweeping spelling reforms that are still in effect today. The man had plenty of flaws, particularly his ego. Upon being congratulated on his arrival to Philadelphia one time, he reportedly gloated, Sir, you may congratulate Philadelphia on the occasion. Still, he had earned the right to be at least a little proud. You also cannot begrudge him the fact that, immersed among all those words, he only ever claimed to have coined one. Demoralize. Say that with me, and note how I'm spelling it with a Z. Demoralize. Doubtlessly inspired by French, this word, as intended by Webster, meant to corrupt or destroy one's morals, your belief in what's right or wrong. I have here his original sample sentence. All wars have, if I may use a new but emphatic word, a demoralizing tendency. Nowadays, however, we're more likely to use the term in the sense of weakening morale instead of moral, as in discouraging or depressing someone, taking away their spirit. That sense would also fit with Webster's, but I've included an additional sample sentence of my own. The students were demoralized after realizing this would be their last class. Finally, I leave you with one last idiom as well, fit for any bibliophile. To take a leaf out of someone's book means to act or behave like someone else. We're not talking about tree leaves here. That's what leads to confusion with this idiom. Uh, leaf, though, is another word for a page or a sheet of paper. Why can't you take a leaf out of your brother's book and start acting more responsible, like him? Another related expression if not an idiom, is never judge a book by its cover, which means not to judge things or people just by appearances alone before you get a chance to know them. I hope that you learned more than you thought you would today about the differences between British and American English, but also about the power that each and every one of us has. Maybe we won't all change the world, but what we do and say does make a difference every day. That's just as true for language as it is for anything else. To practice, I'd like you to write me, using sensible American spelling, ideally, an answer to this following question. What do you do to keep from getting demoralized during difficult times? If you all share some answers in the comments below, then maybe we can take a leaf out of each other's books and use those tips to stay upbeat and positive during dark days. I wish you a very Merry Christmas, if you celebrate it, and the happiest of New Year's. Stay safe out there, guys, and thank you, as always, for watching.